you had a long day, two long days, being overloaded with lots of technology stuff, I can tell you things that would blow your mind, but your mind is already blown. <laughs> so I thought I actually go a different tact this time, and I'm actually going in a new land for myself as well. I want to talk about making some space for the next billion users, thinking about dangerous thinking, what happens in the next five years, six years, seven years on the web. Where are we going right now? What are we doing wrong? And the first thing I want to talk about is some, uh, how do you create something iconic and something that everybody reminds himself of when they, when they see it. And one of the things is music. And this is this one. Everybody knows this, right? Yeah. Richard Strauss, uh, inspired by... Uh, by Inspired by a treaty by uh, Friedrich Nietzsche and actually iconicized by 2001, the movie, with the, with the whole thing throwing up there and bringing a whole new audience to that old piece of music that nobody heard before. And also introducing a whole new audience to the effects of LSD without having to take them. <laughs> so, how do you make something like that and make it different and give it your own style? Check this out. is different. So why does this sound like something unspeakable being done to elephants? The answer, of course, would be these are not professionals. These are a school band or something, or somebody on drugs, or somebody doing something to elephants. But actually, it's not. These are professionals. These were professional musicians, and they didn't make a joke. They basically played this, and they are classical musicians. The Portsmouth Symphonia, in 1970, this was recorded. But there is a plot twist there because none of these musicians were allowed to play the instrument that they know. So the idea, it was an experiment by Brian Eno and other people from the arts exhibit there to see if music is something that needs good coaching or is an art or is just craft. So can a musician take another instrument and actually play it because he got a good coaching, good, good teaching? The result, I think, speaks differently, but it's just an interesting experiment. But it shows one thing, that when you take the right experts using the wrong instruments, you get things that sound like bad things being done to elephants. <laughs> and this is exactly what we're doing with the mobile web at the moment. The mobile web is a bit of a confusion thing. The mobile web was thrown upon us. Out of a sudden, we had smartphones that did web technology. And we had web developers on one side being excited that HTML5 has a new platform and native developers thinking like, oh God, I got to learn the web stuff now. And we all try to make each other's job. And we actually all try to get involved in it because there's so much money in it. It's such a good idea to support now the new smartphones. The challenges in the mobile world for a lot of people, especially native developers, are different ones than we had before. Because on desktop, we had fat resolutions, we had fat pipes, we had really fast computers. And smartphones are basically really bad processors with really good video cards. And there is an unknown smaller screen size. Out of a sudden, the question, remember, remember when our designs were 800 by 600 pixels or 1024 by 768? 
that question is not asked anymore for some reason. So all of a sudden we've got smaller screen sizes to think about. New ways of interaction, touch and voice, not just everybody has a mouse and everybody, ah, some freaks use a keyboard. Flaky, slow connections, like when we heard earlier about you can test if it's a 3G or a 2G connection or a fast connection. That means nothing. My 3G connection walking around the room to the other room is out of a sudden a 3G connection that is not connected. We don't know what the connections are. Limited data plans. Out of a sudden, you, see, you wanted to show that great logo and the data plan of the person is gone with the 150 meg that they had on the SIM card. Less patient end users. End users on the desktop seem to be okay with loading something. They open another tab and do something there and go back when it finished loading. On the phone, you just look at it and scream at it. Especially when you're out for maps, that's my favorite. Like, why does it not find me? Well, it's going to space for you and back. <laughs> but no, we got very excited about this. And you know what? None of these are new problems. None of these are new problems if you had been a web developer from the very beginning with very bad hardware, very bad connectivity, and computers that were just different. You go to universities right now, you go to, you go to libraries, and you find computers that you wouldn't touch anymore, that you wouldn't clean anymore. But people use these things. And we always had the same problems. And there's nothing new. It's just a shiny computer thingy that actually gives us a whole new idea of that is a problem. There was this man who had an idea, Tim Berners-Lee, inventor of the internet, here with his favorite phone ever. And his idea was basically, how about we connect documents worldwide with each other so we don't have to fax them to each other or send them in a letter and actually can edit them together as well. And this is what was called the internet. And it was defined on a simple principle, on flexibility. <laughs> The web is fundamentally designed to work for all people, whatever their hardware, software, language, culture, location, or physical or mental ability. And we keep forgetting that, and we keep limiting ourselves, and we keep thinking we have the perfect user, and nobody else will ever come to our side. Everybody loves to upgrade their browser because we got a nice logo, right? This is not going to happen. Think of everyone, and reach everyone, and you will be successful. So how do we work towards that goal? What do we do right now with the great technologies that we have? Because when I started as a web developer, I had a Windows 3.11 box and not fun. And I had a text editor and I had a few HTML, the, the HTML5 guidelines, HTML4 guidelines to download to know what I'm doing. Today we've got inbuilt tools in the browser. We've got great things we can actually edit in the browser. We can collaborate over the web and we build Strange, strange things. When I come into a new city and I travel all the time right now, I just need to know one thing, the address of my hotel. So I go to the website of my hotel here. I'm not having a go at them. I could pick anything right now. And I get everything that I don't need. I get a calendar. I get like photos. I get like the map that is not clickable. That basically is just, yeah, okay, here's where you are. And uh, this is the address. This is the address in like eight pixels or something like that. So I zoomed out and took a screenshot of that one to show the, to, to show the, the uh, cab driver. But then I thought, haha, it's got a mobile phone. I don't need these kind of things any longer. So Mariona's email came around and hola Chris and had these e this link in there, Hotel Catalonia Ramblas. And it has this wonderful URL. Some of you might disagree, but as an API developer, as somebody who designed and, and structured APIs, this is awesome. I have all the locations. I can actually filter down. I find everything that's going on. I wouldn't have done underscores. I would have done dashes. Whoa. Nice. But um, that's a different story. And that's good. And you click on this link, which goes directly in English to this hotel. And where do you get to? The front page of the hotel group that asks you to find your hotel. That's what I tried to do when I clicked that link, right? Every information was in that link. I didn't get it in the mobile interface. Instead, I've got this menu in the mobile interface that is half English and half German, <laughs> which didn't make any sense at all to me. And even more interesting, none of these things are clickable on my Android device. So at least the menu popped up, but then nothing, nothing was choosable for me anymore. So it's basically shit interfaces. <laughs> like the literal ones in this building. I walked three times past the stalls until I realized that these are the toilets. <laughs> There's no indicator that somebody's in there. So I don't know. And two of them don't close properly. So when you push it, somebody else will push against it <laughs> while he's actually busy doing other things. 
And that's the kind of stuff we build on the web as well. And why do we do this? Not because we're evil, not because we want to hurt elephants, <laughs> but we're busy with other things. We forgot the basics of the web, the accessibility of the web, the simplicity of design, the flexibility of design. Instead, we get very excited about things like resolution of images. <laughs> so here's some dangerous thinking. How about we ask the company that gave us this high-resolution device and ask them to fix it in their browser? Instead of, instead of having to create five different images to send to the, to the different browsers. So, wait a second. We bring a device out that breaks the web. It's now your problem to fix that. Wait, no. You brought a device out that we weren't allowed to change, that we didn't hear anything about before the thing came out. And now you asked us to fix it for you and not even get money for that? We're engineers. We get paid. Or we're designers. We're makers. We get paid. But we're distracted by it. We're like, this is the big problem for web development. What do we do about retina displays? What do we do about Africa? What do we do about India? What do we do about the people that are not online yet, but are, have a voice? What do, we, what do we do about the people who are in countries where cars burn and buildings burn and they would love to take pictures and send that out of their country, but their government censors it? How do we get these people on the web that is for everybody out there? That's our questions. The second problem is developers doing design. That's when you get interfaces like Buxilla and other things that we see earlier. And developers are driving me crazy right now. I've been a developer for 16 years. But developers always go for this thing, oh, oh my project manager tells me to do everything. And I, I don't like it. I don't like CSS. It's hard. <laughs> I try CSS and everything goes wrong and I don't know what's going on there and I hate it and it's, I can't do vertical alignment, I can't design every different letter where it's going. And then you, you get these wonderful questions. This one, this was on Google Plus actually. And it came with this. So uh, I'm like, okay, dude, this is not that hard. CSS is not that hard. Find somebody who's excited about CSS and partner with them if you don't want to do it. But it's basically, oh, when I do vertical alignment, I use a table because it's so much easier. And I just, I just lost it. I'm like, really? In 2013, you use a table because it's easier? And I showed them an article that actually how to do vertical centering in CSS across browsers without much work. And then the answer was like, yeah, it's great because you can now do display table cell and make diffs look like a table and, re and copy a table structure in diffs. This is lazy. This is not wanting to learn. This is just having a little shovel and wanting to dig a hole every time. Or even better, having one hammer and finding nails and trying to hammer them and not realizing that you're hammering on your thumb for the last six months. <laughs> the other reason is, of course, that designers do development. And there's the answer of, there's a jQuery plugin for that. Just look for it, which is the answer to everything. <laughs> it's, think of the elephant. <laughs> Think of the musicians that played the wrong instruments, and that's what we're doing. Designers using jQuery without knowing what the hell this plugin does, but put 15 in there in the page because there's more effects to be done. Developers con uh, saying CSS is broken because they don't want to understand it. This is, what, this is bad things being done to elephants. And think of the elephants, because look at him. <laughs> and don't be lazy. Don't start dreaming. Don't stop dreaming. Like, I'm a designer. I will never understand JavaScript. I'm a developer, I will never understand CSS. These are not magical things. This is not Kiss or Haley or Icelandic. These things have documentation. These things have lots and lots of online training courses. Shay Ho earlier has a great new training course online that you can look at. There's things like Code Academy. There's everything out there. But laziness kills you. Laziness means that you create these interfaces that I don't want to use, even if I really need to go. But I've got no talent for it. I'm, I'm a developer. I don't understand what fonts are. I'm a designer. I don't know what an object is. Bob Ross, the guy that was uh, basically painting on, on television in America and every stoner knows, said this the right way. He said, talent is a pursued interest. So in other words, anything that you're willing to practice, you can do. If you say from the beginning, I can't do it, you will never be able to do it. If you tr give it a try, fail. Give it a try, fail. Give it a try, fail. But the further you go along, the more happier you will be. I, I lately, I mean, I lost, I lost track of CSS a bit because I, I'm a JavaScript guy. I love my JavaScript to bits and I, 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 I make my JavaScript perfect and 
I've got Sublime Text, which has inline editing and inline linting, so I see when I make a mistake in JavaScript, and I also made, made a lot of mistakes in CSS and didn't care. But lately, I looked at the linting of my CSS as well, and some, some like things that CSS lint says is wrong, I'm like, yeah, I disagree. But then I started using it, and all of a sudden, my CSS was a tenth of the size. So just push yourself into directions that you don't think you care anymore, and you will get good results from that. So stop, collaborate, and listen is a very important thing. The amount of developers that give other developers answers on things like, uh, uh, things like Stack Overflow and other bad, bad resources, and designers saying, like, just use the jQuery plugin is bad. We should collaborate. If you don't care about answering about JavaScript and you don't know it, then don't answer. Find, find somebody else to answer who cares. So, looking for technical solutions on Google is for underpaid help desk people, not for, en for enterprise people like us. Like, you go to a help desk, yeah, let me Google that for you and give you the first answer. This is not how we should do research. Because on Google, you find the most successful one, the thing that gave people what they wanted, not necessarily what they needed. It's like saying, oh, Justin Bieber is better than, uh, is better than uh, I don't know, uh, somebody from the 70s because they got more, more Twitter followers. That's not the way it actually should be. You, we should not use Google as our research. We're a community. We know each other. We look, we look for blogs. We look for news groups. We go on Google+. Plus. We use Twitter. We are a community that helps each other out, not find random stuff on Google and say, like, copy and paste. That works. It will not work in a month's time. Use this. It will solve all your problems. It's nonsense used in advertising. This will never be the answer to anything in, in a creative and very, very flexible environment as the web. Finding the how, the how doesn't give you anything if it doesn't answer the why at the same time. We plug the web, we fill it up with fast hacks. Oh, this works, this works, this works. I don't think about it anymore, I just copy it in there again. I used that plugin that made that problem go away. And two months later it causes a new problem in another browser, but I'm already on another project because I don't want to think about it. So if you don't know the why of a solution and it just gives you the how, that's not a solution, that's a stopgap and we never take these stop gaps out anymore. So, this is how I roll. Write a demo of your problem. Put it on JS Fiddle, put it on JS Bin, put it on DabLab, put it on CodePen, wherever you want. Anything that can show code and executes it at the same time next to it and other people can copy yours and fix it with yours. Use these things. These are magic. I, I would have loved to have them in the 90s and beginning 2000s when I was a web developer. I had to put random stuff on my server in like index HTML files and point people to that on mailing lists and things like that. But the collaborative editing suites that we have is the biggest tool that we have to make a problem go away because people that don't understand JavaScript will not be able to fix it. They won't be able to tell you, oh, there's a jQuery plugin for that because they can't put the plugin into your code. They will have to understand your code and help you fix it. Go on Twitter, Google, Facebook and ask people. Let's use hashtags, CSS issue, JS issue maybe. Then people can search for those and answer those. And we can use Twitter for something else than complaining about the government and these kind of things. Get fixes and share your learnings with the community. Let's fix on a code level and not on a, oh, here's a solution level for things that you don't want to think about. Problems will not go away if we abstract them away. This is not how it works. If you're in debt, you actually cannot just put another one in, in, front of your, in front of your screen to say like, hey, I got money on my bank account. This is not going to happen. Start talking to each other. Start sharing. Start, start asking questions. And when people say, oh, I've got no reach. Well, I answer people's stuff on Twitter. On Google+, Plus, the whole Chrome community team answers people's problems as well. We are out there. We just need to be talked to as well. So what does the future bring? Where is the internet going? <laughs> Kittens in 3D is a good bet. I mean, it's a very successful thing at the moment on the internet, so it's, it's going to happen something like that. I don't know where it's going, but I know where it's not going, and it's not a certain hardware. Every single time a new smartphone, a new tablet, a new form factor comes out, every Web designer goes crazy and says, like, oh, that's the only thing we have to build for now. It's so beautiful. Oh, it doesn't, the battery doesn't last. Well, the next iteration will have it. Oh, it, does have, it says it has a different resolution than it really has. Well, that can happen. No. When Microsoft makes mistakes, we nail them to the cross. 
When Apple makes mistakes, we're like, oh, wait, this is going to happen in the next iteration. Don't worry about it. I only paid $2,700 for that. It's not a problem. So think of the floppy disks on the VHSs and the, and the CDs. These things are not necessary anymore. And so will the mobile phone that you just paid 600 euro for in a year as well. If I have to buy a new phone to play a new game, that is not sensible to me. That is not the web. It's not a certain browser. I loved, I loved, I loved when Opera said it's going to do Blink and when Chrome said it's going to do Blink because it killed the WebKit is the only browser engine you will ever need to support. This was the new Internet Explorer 6 thing is the only thing you need to support. There's not one single browser. Deal with it. Try them in different ones. Find the one that you love the most. I don't care which one you use as long as it's a new browser and an, an updating one and not one that is hardwired to a certain piece of hardware and doesn't allow you to get upgraded anymore. This is what kills the internet. This is what makes us as developers do things to elephants. <laughs> it's not an SDK, a framework or a library. There's no magic thing that you can use to start building an environment. I work on Firefox OS. I go to native developers as I, where's your SDK? And I'm like, I call it the web. And you can use any editor you want, any library you want, any language you want, and build stuff with it. This is what we do. It's HTML5. But it's got to have an SDK. No, it doesn't, because the SDK changes every week. And there's new cool stuff coming out. Every six weeks, there's a new browser out you can play with. And it's not demonizing the web. That's what the governments do at the moment. Like, oh my god, look at the web. There's no security, and there's like horrible things being done to elephants on the web while we're spying on you. So people saying like HTML5 will never work or CSS is not a technology because they've never used it or they never cared about it. We should stand up and say like, okay, prove it to me then. Where is the problem that you have? Let me fix that problem for you before you spout another TechCrunch headline that HTML5 is not ready yet. Who taught us to think limited? This was something I had a long discussion with somebody over discussion. We had a back and forth. You don't discuss on Twitter. You win. Um, <laughs> He was basically like, okay, cool, we've got Firefox or S phones. I can't wait to get a phone to start building something. You don't need a phone to build something for Firefox or S. You need HTML5 knowledge and a text editor and a simulator if you wanted to. But we're thinking that way right now. A lot of we, we bred a whole new generation of developers that think they got to have the certain hardware in their hand before they can build a good interface for it. And as a web developer, I always knew I didn't know who's coming. I didn't know what the end user had. I built flexible interfaces that resized accordingly to what they were allowed to do in the certain environment. And that kept me going for 16 years without being bored. If I had built something for WebOS tablets only, would I be happy now? If I built something for uh, iMode or WML, I built WML. I wasn't happy back then. It was a lot of money. But I didn't like it. And I knew it's going to die because it was XML. And it did. It's an old, old idea that we're being thrown against us here. And that's an idea from the 1950s. Uh, in the Journal of Retailing by Victor Lebo, there's not a single picture of that man on the internet. It's really cool. It's really hard to find. <laughs> he basically said in, uh, in the Journal of Retailing that our enormously productive economy, America that is, demands that we make consumption our way of life, that we convert the buying and use of goods into rituals that we seek our spiritual satisfaction, our ego satisfaction, in consumption. We need things consumed, burnt up, replaced, and discarded at an ever-accelerating rate. And you can only do this when you have a fixed state. And you only have a fixed state when you make a certain resolution on a certain phone, on a certain environment. You don't have a fixed state when you build things for the web, because by definition it's not fixed. So you cannot, you cannot play that game. You cannot make it outdated. You cannot outdate the web. You can outdate a phone and sell the next one and tell people, oh, what, you don't have the new phone. What are you? <laughs> Which is this person? Obviously a very happy person in life. Clifford Brooks Stephen. He went further. He said, it's not good enough that things break. It's not good enough that things break quickly and we have to have new ones, because that's what that, uh, that article by Lebo said as well. Make sure things break, otherwise you will not make money with them. A year, a year from now, those shoes should not be possible anymore. They have to buy new ones. But he said, like, that's not good enough. We have to instill in the buyer the desire to own something a little newer, a little better, a little sooner than is necessary. Make it shiny, like make the resolution higher. 
or like give it like oh more memory because you couldn't have bought a SIM card and a memory card and put it in there because you actually made the thing impossible to put your own memory cards in. Plant style obsolescence, even better, occurs when marketers change the styling of products so consumers will purchase products more frequently. The style changes are designed to make owners of the old model feel out of date. And you can see that in shoe fashion. They get higher, lower, wider things every, every half year something else. Or icons, they have drop shadows and, and gradients and rounded corners and then they get flat again. And in a year's time they probably have drop shadows again, but this time CSS is ready. <laughs> In other words, which is in a wonderful paper from 1960 called The Wastemakers, it's a systematic attempt of businesses to make us wasteful, debt-ridden, permanently discontented individuals. And it's true. It's like you see people out there like, I've got an iPhone, I've got an iPhone, three bucks later, oh shit, I don't have the old new iPhone, I need a new iPhone. Oh, I need a cover for my iPhone to make it better. Oh, I need something on the front of my iPhone to make it better. You have a thing that has the internet on it, that you can talk worldwide to people. You can teach yourself a language with that thing. You can actually teach yourself music with that thing. You can be creative and write things. You don't have to have a new one. So how do we go back to the ideals of the web? How do we go back to what Tim Berners-Lee was about? This was at the Olympics in England, where basically he's, uh, they introduced him as like the founder of the internet, beginner of the internet, and he just typed in, this is for everyone. Everyone is allowed on the internet. And this is where it beats every other media. Like if you want to be published in a newspaper, you better be famous or you better spend a lot of money. If you want to be published on the internet, open a blogger account, start writing something. Put a text file somewhere on a server, write something. You are published on the internet. Welcome. Fame awaits you. So in Mozilla, we're a non-for-profit organization to keep the web open and free. We fought the big giant from Redmond back then and basically said there's more than one browser. I'm sorry, you cannot force people to use your interests when there is actually standards out there. And we said, what do we do about the mobile market? What do we do about these systems that are in themselves throwaway products as packages? that don't allow developers to change them, that don't ask for developer input, that don't support the standards that they say they support, we have to do something. With Firefox on desktop, we gave a browser that is completely free, completely open source. Nobody, nobody monitors you in that thing. You can actually fork it and do something with it yourself as well. Chromium, same thing. Chrome, not so much. We said, OK, we need an operating system. <laughs> I said, like, what? <laughs> okay, here's an here's a, here's a empty folder. Let's think about what an operating system would look like. And in two years, we built Firefox OS, which is an operating system for mobile devices, which is completely built on a Linux core to get access to the hardware, JavaScript APIs to, to, to talk to the hardware, and the Firefox browser engine with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Nothing in the system is Java. Nothing in the system is Cocoa. If you want to build for this system, you write a text file, you put it on the web. It's the, the web in mobile devices and completely open. And we thought, okay, this is going to be such an uphill battle because everybody wants to have these closed systems and loves these things. Not so much because we thought different. We did dangerous thinking. We didn't go for the people with lots of money. We didn't go for the people that already have iPhones and Android phones that we have to fight, which come out every two months and we don't know what's going to come in the next one. We're targeting the emerging markets, the places that don't have iPhones, that don't have Android phones and cannot afford them and in, or don't even get them in their countries. So Firefox OS will be published in places where the others just don't go because it doesn't make any sense for them. It's very affordable hardware, about uh, 70 euros for a phone, completely open, SIM, uh, SIM unlocked, everything. No credit card needed. You want apps, you need a credit card big, big blocker for lots and lots of people on this planet, and including my brother in Germany, which should be no better, but he doesn't have a credit card. <laughs> Web technologies through and through. Can, can go to GitHub, Mozilla, GitHub slash Mozilla slash B2G, download the operating system, download the interface, it's called Gaia, which is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Send us, uh, send us forks, send us requests, we can actually put that into the system itself. Full hardware access. There's no such thing as saying like, okay, you don't get the camera because you don't write any Cocoa, sorry. Oh, here's $99 if you want to build the first app for us. Not with us. Write your first app, put it on the web, point it to us. 19 mobile partners and five hardware partners. At Mobile World Congress, we announced like worldwide 19 partners and five hardware companies that want to build these phones with us. And I was just shocked 
because I mobile World Congress is evil. It's just like it's this massive sales show with people that want to just basically sell you a new phone. And I thought they were like they just laugh at us like yeah these stinking hippies open source guys in the corner there. <laughs> But we were the only interesting thing on the menu, and we have it out now. Here's a phone that you can play with later on as well, which is the Geeks phone, which is done here in Barcelona uh, as a preview for developers that runs operating system Firefox OS. Nothing in there is not HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. You can build this, you can fork this, you can build an interface for that if you wanted to and flash it on your own phone if you don't like our interface. But that's not what we want you to do. We want you to build apps. <laughs> Because we broke the system of the apps. The app was the other big thing. Like, how do I get content on my very, very expensive, cool phone? Oh, I have to go to a closed marketplace. First, give them my firstborn's name and some blood and whatever, <laughs> and enter my credit card details, even if I only want to have free apps. And then, have, and then I'm standing there like, OK, what is a good app? I don't know. So I basically have to click through everything, read people's reviews that probably were done by Mechanical Turk or somebody else and have to find the app by name. As an app developer, I have to get the name of my app known. So I have to pay TV ads or newspapers or these kind of things to tell people about the name of my app. This is HTML5. We can index the web. Google can find everything you want and probably don't want on the web already. So why can't we index HTML5 applications? Well, in Firefox OS, we can. This is the search that you have in Firefox OS. You just swipe to the, to, right to the left and you type in, for example, the name of a band. And you get apps that have to do with that band. You've got Wikipedia, you've got SoundCloud, you've got YouTube, you've got Metro Lyrics. We link the search term to the app and not the app to the search term. And when you click any of those, the search that you type in gets through. So on Amazon now, I'm starting searching for Linkin Park rather than having to type that in again, like I showed earlier that a lot of mobile interfaces do. Like, oh, now type it in again because it's so much fun to type on a phone. <laughs> and that works with everything. That works with food, that works with movies, that works with, uh, with music. We made app discovery as easy as surfing the web because it's the web and it already is a distribution platform. Why should I go to a closed marketplace where I have to play by their rules if I can publish myself? Talk about publishing myself. To turn any HTML5 page into an app for Firefox OS, you define a manifest file and save it there. And you go to, you can, we have a marketplace. If you want that, you can do that. You point the manifest URL in the marketplace and we list it in the marketplace. You upload some pictures. We review it for security. We review it for content. And we get you, we get you there in a short period of time. If you don't like marketplaces, you write this in your app. It's a JavaScript of the three lines here, more or less. Navigator, Moz apps, install, pointing to the manifest URL. On success handler, the app is installed. On error, the app is not installed. So if you have a successful website and you want to turn it into an app, you Google choose. People finding you on the web already advertises for your app. It doesn't need to be start from scratch again and get people to review your app and these kind of things. You can put a button there and install anything from the web into the Firefox OS device. And it's coming. Developer Hub is the resource if you want to learn anything about it. There's design principles, what makes a good HTML5 app. There is uh, demo apps that you can download and change. There's ways to build like some SDK, like Lego brick style things if you want to put your app together from that. Um, we've got a few, a few demo scripts on performance and then information how to publish on the marketplace as well or how to self-publish on the web and all the security reviews and all the things that you need to know. It's a one-stop solution for you. So the good thing about this is you don't write for a bored audience that takes out that phone and compares it to the iPhone 5 next to it, the game that they spend $80 on it. Like, that's not as fast, really. <laughs> You're actually getting to people who are hungry. They want to be on the web for the first time. So it's your task. Our task, my task, to give them the greatest first experience of the web ever. That time when you went home and the first time you typed the URL in and you saw a picture almost appearing in the five and a half minutes and you're like, whoa, this is awesome. <laughs> and we cannot do this because everybody that comes on the web now newly will not be on desktops. They will be on mobile phones. This is the market that we have. The whole of Africa doesn't have an infrastructure for desktops, but it has a mobile infrastructure. And 
getting people online there on the web with their phones should not be the barrier of like a two thousand dollar phone or six hundred euro phone it should be a phone that they can afford and it gives them the freedom to do it it's html5 without the lockout you can get to the accelerometer you can get to the camera you can store things in index db you can store things in the on the device as well Everything is an open standard that is also implemented across other browsers. Geolocation came from W3C, but Mozilla was the first one to implement them. It went to all the browsers after that. The same with IndexedDB and some other things. And none of this is for Firefox only. This is for the web. Anybody can implement that. And that's the cool thing. That's why I love working there. I don't have to hide things from other people. I can just throw it out. Hope it sticks. So the website is your ad. People find your website, they can install the app. And it's minimal extra work because it works across browsers. There's a great article by Adios Mani came out yesterday, for, uh, uh, an, uh, an evangelist for Chrome who shows how to build an HTML5 app with all kinds of libraries to actually roll out for Firefox OS and bring it onto the device, roll out for Chrome OS and roll out for desktop at the same time just with one build script. And I love that my competitor does these kind of things because it's an open system. I don't have to do it myself. So you are the people that we need to keep that web open and not get people excited about closed products that get outdated and artificially outdated all the time. We need coders, designers, architects, makers, writers, all of you. This is a great example how to explain to somebody what Pythagoras is about. You could write 15 pages or you can show something like that. And we need creative people to tell them your stories, how you found the web, how you got excited about it, and get the next generation excited about the web as well, rather than get them excited on little things that are outdated and packaged up for them and don't allow them to go past what a certain company or a policy allows them to do. The web is for us and we should take it back continuously. There's a great system as well called webmaker.org, which is uh, our system for training people up on the web. There is, uh, there's a batches system there for, like, uh, gaming, uh, for gaming learning programs, there's uh, videos there, there's an editor there for children to learn their first HTML by editing errors in HTML documents. And there's videos, video formats there, there's Popcorn there, which is a, an online video editing tool to allow you to mix YouTube videos with live HTML content and make interactive experience of the web that get packaged up and sent to other people. And that's all we got time for, so I thank you very much.